All right, in this lesson, I'm gonna walk you through how to improvise over the tune like someone in love. Now, this is taken from a live lesson that I did for all the members inside of Jazz Piano School, and it was so good that I decided to share it with you. My name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School. Don't forget to go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash improv to check out my brand new improvisation mastery specialty course. With that being said, let's dive right into this lesson, and I'll walk you through how to improvise over like someone in love. So like someone in love, um, great tune, great tune, right? And essentially, hey, John, good to have you here. Uh, yes, very wet here in Sacramento too. Lots and lots of rain. <laughs> um, I've been filming the improvisation uh, mastery course and it's pretty much almost done. Just making a lot of practice exercises right now and um, accompanying sheets um, for the videos. And one of the things about improv, obviously today is going to be about improv, but the default scales, uh, you know, as an educator, we're always learning. I'm sure all of you, there's lots of educators on here in different capacities. We're always learning based on what you're teaching. When you dive into a, a topic and you're researching it in depth and you're having to explain it to people, your perception changes a lot on that particular topic. So as far as default scales go, I'd really want people to understand this default principle about the notes you use over scales. And I think this is going to be extremely helpful for you all when improvising. So here, here it is. Anytime you have a major seven chord, 99% of the time, you can always use a major scale to improvise. Okay. Now my core philosophy with improvisation is obviously to target the chord tones because they reflect the chord. So even if I'm moving up and down, I'm still thinking about my chord tones if I want to create space or do anything like that. So I might go. So I started on the fifth and landed on the third and then ended my line on the third, right? But in between that, obviously I was moving up and down with some scalar motion. I did one little skip and then I did some more scalar motion. Now the scalar motion in my line is very, very important because that's going to allow me to connect my chord tones. And obviously we need some scalar motion to connect our chord tones. Otherwise it's gonna sound too choppy. We can't just jump between chord tones the whole time because then it just sounds, you kind of sound like a robot, right? But that is the foundation. So. The scalar motion you can always use for a major seven chord is going to be a major scale. Okay. That's pretty self-explanatory. Let's go to the other chords, the minor seven. So for example, in the second measure, the C minor seven there, the scalar motion you can always use for a minor seventh chord is going to be a Dorian scale. Now, what is a Dorian scale? A really good way to remember this is to simply take a major scale and flat the third and the seventh. So if I play a C major scale, my fourth finger's working pretty well right now. <laughs> I'm happy about that. I can flat my third and my seventh of my scale and get my Dorian scale. So to get a Dorian scale, just flat the third and the seventh from a major scale. Easy, right? So when I'm improvising over the C minor seven in this particular case, Right, my scalar motion is gonna be that Dorian scale I just showed you, but I'm, I'm always targeting those chord tones. The chord tones are always front and center in my mind because I wanna reflect the harmonies of the chord. Right, so I might go. Started on the seventh, landed on the fifth. But my scalar motion to connect that stuff was the Dorian scale, right? And a lot of students, when learning about modes and scales, they're like, how do we use the scales to improvise? It's the number one question I get. I had that question too. And a lot of times in the improvisation mastery course, I'm finding myself saying, don't overlook the power of just scalar motion. I mean, just moving up and down a scale is a great way to improvise. Right? I was just moving up and down and then coming back down that scale. That's a great line to play, right? So scalar motion is very important when we know the scales to play and the notes that connect the chord tones. Obviously I started on a chord tone and guess what I did? I landed on a chord tone as well, all right? 
So that's going to be our minor seven. Let's go to our dominant seventh chords now. Our dominant seventh chords are going to be super, super simple. And it's going to be a major scale with a flat seven. Major scale with a flat seven. So on C7, for example, in the fourth measure, right? Take, our, take your major scale, flat the seven. Boom. Now, for a lot of you, this may be review. Some of it, it may be new to you guys. Or it may just be, you may have known this and just thinking about it in a different way may be helpful for you right now, right? So for the C7, I'm going to flat that 7 and I get my Mixolydian scale, okay? Now for our Locrian scale, our minor 7 flat 5, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a major scale a half step up. I'm going to play a major scale a half step up. So for my A minor 7 flat 5 chord, I'm going to play a B flat major scale from A to A. But again, like I keep saying, guess what? Just because I have this B flat in there, it doesn't mean that's gonna be my focus, right? My focus are always the chord tones. The B flat's just to connect the notes. Now, can we use a natural nine? Yes, you can use a natural nine in place of the flat nine. A lot of students ask that question too. So take your scale that I just played and change the flat nine in the scale to a natural nine. Right? Some students like that better. I love the B flat sound. I use both. You know, when I'm doing my bebop approaches to like the third, I'll use that one or I'll use this as well. The half step approach is a great one, you know. So anyway, minor seven flat five chords get a half step up major scale, but from the root to the root. So again, let's try another one just for example. If I were to play over a D minor seven flat five, I'd play an E flat major scale from D to D. That's essentially my Locrian mode. It's also a C natural minor from D to D. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. And the, the, the best way is gonna be the way that helps you learn it the, the easiest, okay? Just like they say in wine, what's the best wine? It's the one you like, <laughs> all right? So that's the same thing with this. Um, the best way to think about something is the way that makes it easiest for you. All right, don't forget that. So there's many, many ways to think about things, okay? Oh, thanks, Ray, I appreciate that. <laughs> really, really awesome, thank you so much. All right, so, um, so let's check out this movement here. So I essentially have covered a lot of, th that's like 99% of um, chords, you know, for everything you're going to see, okay? That's essentially just covers like every improvisation skill you could possibly see at like a diatonic level. Now, obviously, we, have, we start to get into extensions, altered scale, half whole scale, things like that to give you an out sound. But just for a regular diatonic sound, right? What I just what I just played there was all chord tones and scalar motion based on the scales that I just gave you, right? Now Dunya has a great question. Why'd you change the E flat over B flat and second measure to C minor seven over B flat. These are uh, I real pro chords, Dunya. So there, there might be a little bit different than like um, what uh, the the I real. Let me see what's in the um, real book. Honestly, there's there's so many different changes for this. I'm gonna see if I can pull up the real book right now. I have it. I have it kind of queued up here. I just want to see. So the real book also has the E flat going to D, going to C minor. The, the, the transcription chart that you guys might have, I apologize. Um, that might be a little bit different from these particular chords. But if you see it in a real book, I'm looking at a real book right now, you're going to see E flat major. You're going to see the changes that are essentially right on the screen right now. So anytime you open to like a, a standard real book, real book number one is the one I just looked at, you're going to see the changes that are in the iReal Pro right now. Um, yeah, that, those are exactly the same. So let's talk about these right now because nothing really changes based on what I'm going to teach you now. You can still apply that to the transcription that, uh, we went over last week. Okay. 
So here's our E flat major seven. Now our G seven over D, anytime you have slash chords, you don't really need to worry about the bass note at all, okay? So you can still just think about this particular motion as being a G7 chord. Here's our C minor. Again, like I said, Dorian. Now it goes to C minor over B flat. That doesn't affect your improv whatsoever. You still play C minor seven for that entire bar. Now the only difference here, like if you play an E flat chord over the B flat, like Chris is asking, the only thing that's happening here is that you're adding essentially the C. Okay, so the scale doesn't really change. The difference between a C Dorian scale and an E flat major scale is this A flat. So you can kind of choose what sound you like. Like if you think E flat over B flat, then you'll have what? Okay, so sorry, this is a, a rule I didn't go over. I went over major seventh chords. Even when you have triads, everyone, you can still use your major scale over. So if you see a triad or a slash chord, like a triad on top and then B flat on the bass, it would still, you still treat that as a major seven. So essentially a triad is just the major scale. So you have two options there, right? You can go with the C minor seven Dorian, which gives you this natural, a natural sound, which is a color in its own. There's no right or wrong answer here, everyone, right? And you can go with the E flat major scale, which gives you the A flat. Now in both of these instances, the thing that's really important to remember is this the A flat, whether it's A flat or A natural, that's not a chord tone. That's not a chord tone, right? So it's a connecting note. So we're not gonna really focus on that note either way, but if we want to connect between the five and the seven of our, of our C minor seven or the third and the five of our E flat chord, you're gonna be having two different connecting notes right? Or this. So they're different colors, just like red versus green, right? So if I'm soloing, that would be my Dorian and here's my E flat major. Right? So both are great options. And then this is the great thing about jazz and why I love jazz is I'm going to let it, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide what you want to want to add in there. Okay. Let's keep going. Our A minor seven flat five again. Okay, our B flat major scale from A to A. A flat seven again, just our regular mixolydian scale. Remember for all dominant chords, we take our major scale, flat the seven. Okay, G minor seven, Dorian, right? So the first thing that I wanna do right now, I've kind of covered theoretical knowledge i want let's cruise through the rest of the tune check out any weird portions to this so right now you want to kind of check out the baseline motion anytime you're about to improv so we have this downward motion right analysis is really good for you if you don't know how to do that you can write it in i prefer the top chords to this tune so essentially instead of f minor seven going to A, D, G. I just like a regular two five in there. I think it sounds better. F minor seven, B flat, E flat. So just a regular two five. So if I was soloing over this, here's my F minor seven. Okay, to the E flat major seven. We have another two five going to the key of A flat, right? The B flat minor seven to E flat seven. I'm gonna keep looking here, nothing really out of the ordinary. Okay, boom. So the B flat seven sharp five, a lot of times students, you know, and in my case too, when you see a chord that has a, a written extension, right? For this augmented chord. You can take your mixolydian scale and add the sharp five to your scale. Okay, I don't usually use much scalar motion over the sharp five. I like to use a lot of arpeggios over sharp fives. I think they just sound better. Right, but anyway, if you do want to use scalar motion, 
take your mixolydian and just add that sharp five, flat seven, and then one. Okay. Tom says, would you repeat the reason for the changes you made in bar five? Yes. Um, Tom, that's just a, that's just a preference. That's just a preference of mine. I just like I just like the two five better than the uh, than than the A minor seven going to D seven. So I like the F minor seven. Bar five, here's bar six. I just play a B flat seven for that full bar and then go to an E flat major seven. Sometimes I'll change it up. F minor seven, A minor seven, D seven, G minor. It just sounds a little too complicated to me. You know, it's just like, why, why do you, it, it's essentially a reharm of the two five. So the B flat seven going to the F, E flat major seven. So that's just a preference. You know, whatever you guys like, play whatever you like though. I do, I like both. I just prefer the, the um, regular 2-5 going to E flat rather than the A minor 7 to D7, okay? Um, let's go on here. Let's check out the rest of this. So the top portion would be the same. Um, okay, the only other tricky part would be this F sharp diminished 7 here, right? So for our diminished 7 chords, what scale are we going to use, right? Anyone know? I know there's a huge delay, so <laughs> by the time you write it in, I'll probably be talking already. But I'm just leaving space for you guys to ask yourself, hey, Joe, Joe's here. What's up, Joe? Thanks for being here, man. Um, so F sharp diminished, we're going to use a whole half. Diminished scales, we'll use whole half. So take your root, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step. Whole step, half step. Right? Again, still focusing on those chord tones. Right? So whole half. Okay? Whole half. Close, Dunya. You just had them mixed up. You had you you just gotta reverse them. So that's that's really it. There's no other real sticking points, okay, in this particular uh, tune in general. To me, the first four measures are really going to be the hardest part of this tune because you have this downward motion that kind of may give people some trouble to create some lines, right? So let's go back up to the top and we'll, I'll start to play a little bit for you guys and talk about some things. All right. Grab some water real quick. Texas is here. Hey, George. Good to have you. Susanna says, what can we do with E-flat 6 in scalar motion as seen in Pen U Ultimate Measure of Fake Book version? Suzanne, I'm not sure what the Pen U Pen Ultimate Measure of Fake Book version is. What when you have an E flat six, E flat six is still E flat major. So a major seven and a major six are really the same thing. If you have an E flat six chord, the one thing you can do with all six chords, I'll do, I'll do it in the key of C, is if you do know your uh, your major six bebop scale, you could do scalar motion with a major major six bebop scale. Your major six bebop scale is going to be a passing tone between your five and your six because that way it's going to align your chord tones on the downbeat. Right? So for an E flat six, you just take your major scale, again, put a passing tone, a chromatic passing tone in between the five and the six. So the very last measure, yeah. So you can cheat. You can treat the E flat six as a major seven or a six chord. It really doesn't matter. They're both major chords. They're both one chords. And again, as I like to say, the the major seven chord came around a little bit later in history. Um, bebop players, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, they were using more sixth chords. That's why you might see, you know, and obviously. Um, uh, music music composers, you know, writing for musicals and things like that. Um, all the composers back then, they liked six chords. So you might see six chords. You might see some major seven chords. More modern tunes, you'll see more major six chords. Okay, so here we go. 
your goal always with your improv should be more or less a step-by-step. -step. Um, I have benchmarks set up in the improvisation mastery, which is really, really cool. So your first benchmark is to be able to solo over any tune using just chord tones. All right. Using just chord tones. So if I were to put IRL Pro on, here's what the first, uh, I won't be able to put the chart down. I don't know what's best for you guys. If you want to see the chords, you want to see my hand, probably see, you guys probably have your chart in front of you. So just look at the chart. Um, here would just be chord tones. I'm going to use the, oh, they're playing. I'll use the chord that the bass player is playing. my sharp five these are all chord tones believe it or not <laughs> I had to change it there here's my diminished chord really your first benchmark to improv and this will never change this is this will never change no matter what song you're playing over if you can do that you're in a really great position because the, again the chord tones are the anchors to the harmony they literally create the chord right now to practice this okay you would arpeggiate your chord tones in your right hand I, I know a lot of you guys have done this or probably or, or has heard me teach this Okay, when I go to my G7 over D, I'm gonna just gonna play root position here, but I'm gonna play a D in the bass. So this is me practicing. This would what this is what your practice would look like if you're shooting for benchmark level one, just chord tones. I'm practicing my chord tones. There's no time here. Okay. George, the best scale for the diminished chord is gonna be a whole half scale. So start on the note, start on the root of the chord, go up a whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step. So for all diminished chords, you'll use whole half. That's, that's what it is right there. So you can do this in a number of ways. You can do it, I always recommend doing it with no time first. Okay, and this is an improv practice system that's in the course that's coming out on the 23rd, okay? You can use this system every single time. So practice your chord tones and learn them first. Then apply a little bit of pressure, right? So I'm gonna put my Iro Pro on to like, you know, for you guys, whatever you would wanna start out with that makes you comfortable and, and can like grab the chord tones. Let's start at 60, okay? Now for the measures, all of these um, have two chords per measure. So when you're practicing your chord tones, one thing that you want to do is you're not going to be able to go up and down, right? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, one and two and one and two. And you're going to have to switch um, because there's two chords per measure. When there's one chord per measure, you have enough beats to come back down. So that's going to help you practice this exercise. Okay, so here's my example of that. Here we go, just chord tones, right? Now I can come back down because it was all C minor, right? Woo. This might even be a little bit too fast for some of you too, and that's okay, just bump the tempo down. All the way back down, because it was a full measure. Okay, so on and so forth, you get the point. Right, add a little pressure. Once you start to get comfortable with that, test yourself, right? You should be able to do this at least at like 90 BPM, I would say minimum. 
So here's what 90 sounds like. No left hand. And I would say a good goal to assess yourself and say, okay, I completed the practice exercise at like a benchmark tempo would be 120. If you can do that through the entire tune with no mistakes at 120 BPM, you got it. It's solid. And I'd also, I mean, don't stop there. Obviously you can keep going 150, 180, 150 is like you're swinging away. 180 is like you've mastered it. Okay. You really don't ever need to come back to that particular exercise ever again. Um, so, okay. Let's get, uh, cool. That's great, Ray. Thanks so much for, for, for throwing that in there. Yes, it, it really does work. I mean, when, when you do it and it's too bad, I mean, you're going to hear me say things over and over and over again. And obviously when I release the course, you're going to hear me say the same things over and over and over again. Um, and, and just like the other teachers out there, right. When you guys teach things, the more you teach, the more you realize, wow, I'm, I'm really just saying the same thing over and over and over again to all of my students because those are the things that works, right? It's, it's literally proven to work. So you, you find yourself just saying the same thing over and over again. Okay. Now you've practiced. Let's say we just practiced. You crushed your chord tones. Now it's for the fun part. Let's improvise, right? So you got you got yourself up to at least 90. Before you start to actually improvise with the chord tones, get to at least 90, okay? But now, what I want you to do is improvise. Okay, by the way, I, I gotta show you guys one thing. For the advanced players that wanna go deeper into your chord tones, because check it out, your hands aren't gonna be always over root position chords, right? Because to go from here to here, or where's a good where's a good example? When I go from my C7 to my F7 chord, right? I don't want to have to jump my hand when I'm improvising, right? So what's the best thing to do? We need to practice voice leading our inversions. So if you're a more intermediate player to advanced player, instead of jumping around doing root position chords, practicing your voice leading of inversions is going to be the best next step because it's going to allow your hand to stay in one spot. So instead of doing this, I would do this for a root position, second inversion to root position, or I could have gone up to first inversion too. You can switch it up when you go back. So here's second inversion. I like root position better here just because the base it's following the bass motion down. Now I'm going to do first inversion of my A minor seven flat five. Now first inversion of my A flat seven, right? And then first inversion of my G minor, third inversion of my C, uh, first inversion of my F. Okay. So you're voice leading. Now, eventually you have to jump up back up. Cause like usually when you voice lead, your hand starts to tend to just shift down. But that's going to be the next best step for intermediate to advanced players when practicing their chord tone improv, okay? But now let's do some um, improvisation. Before we add pressure in the system, my practice system, you're always going to play and try to play lines without the tempo on. Without iReal Pro on, without tempo on, just try to play your lines, keeping track of the beat internally. Um, and so this is what I would do. If your left hand's strong enough to just play whole note bass notes, I would try to do that. If not, completely okay. But just to hear some of the downward harmony, okay, that way you can kind of hear just the, the lower portion. So here we go. One, two, three, and four. You don't have to count out loud. I'm just doing this to show you, but this is what I would try and do. So I'm using all chord tones. I'm just kind of keeping track of the tempo inside of me. If I have, if I find myself getting stuck, I can just stop. So let's say I get stuck on this A flat. I'm like, oh shoot. Okay. Where are my chord tones for the A minor seven? I'm going to look for them. I'm just going to stop and be like, okay, they're right here. Let me go to the G. And then what if I, if I get stuck, I could be like, uh, okay. G minor seven. So 
So you're essentially working out your lines based on the chord tones you've just learned in a slow manner without pressure. So right now we're essentially in a controlled environment with no pressure, right? And the, the beauty of this improvisation practice system is that you go through these steps to simulate spontaneous uh, improvisation in a pressured situation because as the tempo is counting away and you need to create spontaneity, that's a really hard environment to start to do that, right? Okay, we start sweating. We're like, oh shoot, oh shoot. Things start to break down real fast in pressured situations. I'm sure all of you have been in some situation where, man, some, some, maybe someone got hurt or there was an accident or some sort of pressure you had to do, right? It's things in pressured situations where you're forced to act quickly without like just have to go through the motions that's why people in the military, anyone, responders, they train and train and train and train. You know why? Because when they get into that pressured situation, everything is clockwork. It's like natural. Your brain shuts off and your body's doing the motions. That's how, sorry to use such a real life example, but this is how you want yourself to respond to changes in tunes. That all your practice and your training is done so much in different types of environments that when you get to 120, 150 and you're soloing, you're not really even thinking anymore. And that's how you start to incorporate that stuff. Okay, I went on a little tangent there. So let's do, um, let's say we practice in our controlled non-tempo situation, time to flip the metronome on. So I'm gonna flip the metronome on 70 here. And again, whatever tempo, you might need to start it at 50, right? Let's start it at 50 and see what happens. Two three and four and leave a little space right four one and two I didn't count that right, sorry. But you get the picture. You may need to start there. And that might be very challenging. I love when students say, oh, I can only play it at a faster tempo. That should never be a rule. <laughs> okay, let me tell you right now. The ability to play things at a faster tempo should never be a rule you rely on, okay? You should always be able to do things slower than you can do them fast. And if you can't, I'm sorry to say there's an issue, <laughs> all right? So start as slow as you need to and build up, okay? So enough with chord tones, let's get to um, some more advanced stuff. I wanna go through scalar motion now and then get into bebop and improvisation tools to add on to our bebop, okay? So I've taught you the chord scales. How do we start to practice if you're a more intermediate player and you wanna start to get into your chord scales? The first step, is always, again, no time, no tempo. So I'm gonna move up and down my chord scales to practice my chord scales just like I went through my chord tones. When I was outlining the chord tones, I'm gonna do this exact same thing with my chord scales. Now check it out. I'm gonna go from the roots to the sevenths, okay? Because that's gonna be a uh, metrically um, satisfying exercise. Okay? And you're also landing on the seventh. You're also outlining the chord tones as well. So it just fits that better. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three, four. Now I'm going to go to my G7 mixolydian. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. Now, as I do this, you can probably already hear the melody really fitting in over top of this improv. And I'm just playing scales. Here's my Dorian. I'll do my Dorian scale again over the new bass note, my B flat. A minor seven flat five, here's my Locrian, my B flat major from A to A. Seven to the root, here's my Mixolydian. Okay, so on and so forth. No tempo, no time. And again, now the intermediate to advanced players to make this a little bit harder, you can always you don't have to start on the root. I challenge you to start on the thirds. Start 
start on the thirds because again my reasoning to this to practice this way is because your hand isn't always going to be over the root you're not always going to be starting your improv lines on the root and ending on the root that's why you want to start from the roots the thirds the fifths and the sevenths why because those are the chord tones and then the anchors to the chord so the more you can get used to starting your scalar motion moving up and down and also don't just go up and down maybe just go up from the third Right? Just go down from the fifth. So again, and then from the fifth, fifth. Okay, all these different ways are going to challenge your mind, your eyes, your brain, your motion to really get super, again, we're trying to get as comfortable as possible with all the things, the, the tools, the motions that we need to create spontaneous improv. Spontaneous improv, that sounds good, will never come out if you just keep trying random things. Like you have to practice movements, you have to practice tools in controlled environments and slowly lead to a less controlled environment where again, like I said before my analogy, your body is just going through the motions and you're expressing on the spot without even thinking. Okay, one sec. All right, now the benchmark for this is the same. It's the same. I would practice this, you know, at, let's let's see what 90 sounds like. Again, my tempo scale for all of you always is 60, 90, 120, um, 150, 180. 120 is like a solid tempo to move on. Let's see what 190, what's, what, what uh, 90 sounds like. Right, so for this particular exercise, that's going to be way too fast, obviously, because we have two chords um, per measure. So you would need to bump that down, right? Whatever it is. So if you have one, da, 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 that'd probably be about 60. So this is the only really instance where the tempo scale doesn't work because, let me see. So you're essentially going to double time this. Right, so that's at 60 and that's pretty fast. So essentially you could pull 20 beats off that and that would even be, might, still might be too fast for you. So I'd say 40. But again, make sure you get it down before putting the pressure on, okay? Once you have this practice exercise down, again, this is level two now. This is level two of improvisation. Level one is chord tones. Level two is connecting the chord tones. Level three essentially is gonna be bebop, approach notes, all right? And don't, you know, when I say the levels, it's level one is not easy. You know, it sounds easy like, oh, just levels one, two, and three, right? These are really difficult steps, okay? So it's okay to take your time on each one of these. Let's go to some improv now. Now, when I go to my improv, I want to start to add musicality to this, right? And by musicality, I mean rest, space, and things like that. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. If you're just kind of absorbing all this, um, that's great as well. But when I go to add musicality, we're starting to improvise again with space, right? Connecting chord tones, hitting the chord tones on the downbeats, leaving space, trying to create different types of motifs, dynamics, things like that, just to make it interesting. Because obviously just running up and down scales all day isn't going to sound that interesting. So rhythms, contrasting rhythms, things like that. Here's what 90 would sound like. Whoops. Again, so you're playing benchmark number two is going to be the use of chord tones and scalar motion based on the scales that you practice. Let me go a little bit slower, actually. Here's 70.
our top again. Okay, so on and so forth. Now, if I speed this up, I mean, that's that's still, you know, it's not going to really sound like jazz yet. But again, we're building a foundation and it can, right? It can. It can still sound like jazz. So if I were to bump this up to like more of a standard tempo and throw some voicings in. It can sound, it starts to actually resemble jazz, right? In some sort of capacity. And that's what your goal is. That's your benchmark goal. Not really with the voicings in yet, because that's going to, again, that's going to start to distract your hands. You really want to practice your right hand alone as much as possible um, in order to really work on your right hand improv. Anytime you add another component in, right? Another component into your practice, it's going to take away from what you're working on. So don't put that left hand in even at all until you're really comfortable. Okay. So the next level here is essentially bebop approach notes. Um, so when we start to add bebop approach notes in, you get all these different types of these motions, right? <laughs> So the bebop approach notes is what takes your level two playing, which I just demonstrated, to essentially more of the authentic jazz sound, more of the authentic jazz sound, because now you're getting tension and release, tension and release, which, which creates kind of like that jazz improvisation sound that everyone's really looking for. It's really just those three steps in general will really start to create that sound. You don't even need many fancy half whole scales. <laughs> right? Oops. You don't need the altered scale or anything like that. Those are improvisational tools. Like those are colors, like very miscellaneous colors. And you know, they're only used in specific moments, but to create a foundation between these first three levels and be able to play this way is really a huge, it's, it's the 80, 20 rule, right? If you can do these three levels, you've essentially covered 80% of the improvisational sound that you're gonna want and need to create and be happy improvising. Learning your half whole scales, your altered scales, your blues scales, these are all textures, like miscellaneous spices that you might have to go to the supermarket for because you don't have them, right? But we all have salt, pepper, you know, you might have garlic powder, onion powder. These are common spices, common household cinnamon, right, in the house. And so, when you need another spice, because you need a flavor, because you're not always, you know, when you cook different dishes, you're like, oh, I need this flavor. That's essentially, if I wanted to go blues on this, then I'd play my blues scale. That's just one flavor. That's one style. That's not really the heart of improv. It's just like that's the blues breakout into improvisation. Okay. Hopefully, I mean that's that should make sense, right? So if I were to go, um, you know, your B. I don't want to. I, I want to kind of demonstrate a little bit more for you guys because I've been talking a lot. But from let's do level two again. Again, chord tones and scalar motion. And I'm just going to go through the entire tune now. 
Um, this is all recorded so you can watch back. You can steal my lines. You can do this yourself with the chords. Okay, so here's 90 BPM. I'll go through the entire tune. And here we go. Level two. for a voicing there. Sharp five. Just create some nice melodies here. important things. When you are using scalar motion to lead into another chord, it's important that you lead into a chord tone. So if I'm going, like if I go, obviously I don't want to hit an E flat over that G7, right? I would might do this. Um, Sorry, I was <laughs> having a little. So this E natural here, by the way, this is a, just a little side point, which I was I was kind of thinking about. So the E flat really works well over the G7 chord, so the flat 13 essentially, because it's leading into that C minor uh, sound. Like anytime you have a dominant chord going to a minor chord, Generally, for the most part, um, you want to have the flat 13 in the dominant chord. So here's my G7 chord, my flat 13 is E flat. Now the reason you want to use this in your scale is because it turns into the minor third of the minor chord that it's moving to. So if I go... That's going to sound better than going... You see how that sounds a little funny? How much better does that sound than this? It sounds a little weird, right? So when you add that flat 13 in, so essentially your mixolydian scale. Now your default is your mixolydian scale. This is a very, uh, you know, meticulous harmonic type of improv movement. When you have a dominant chord moving to a minor chord, take your mixolydian scale and make your 13 a flat 13. So any scalar motion you'd have would be with the flat 13. Okay. Um, Dunya says, for anticipated approaches, is the bebop approach scale tone above to half step below going to be the scale tone from the previous scale used or from the new chord scale? When you have the scale chord scale above to half step below, going to the scale tone from the previous scale um it's going to be from the current scale uh that you're on i'm trying to get a good situation here um so, Dunya, can you give me an example, like a, a certain particular type of chord? Like if I'm going to that my A minor 7, I'm going to use my chord scale from my uh, C minor Dorian, right? So if I were using, if I'm doing this, right, I would do chord scale above from my C minor 7 to half step below to get me into the third of the A minor 7 flat 5. 
Now, again, a lot of the things about Bebop approaches, guys, is that you'll learn is that in the course, for the most part, when you have Bebop lines, your Bebop approaches aren't necessarily in the middle of the line. They can be, and that adds to more complexity. But generally speaking, again, 80-20 rule, most of your Bebop approaches are going to start your line or end your line. Start your line or end your line. And when you have a lot of chords like this, I'm trying not to think about Bebop approaches because it's already complex enough. So when I would go, if I were to actually solo over this in a manner that, like, you know, a professional manner, if I bump the tempo up to 100, let's see where that feels. I'm thinking more about just nice melodies and maybe a couple small Bebop movements, all right? Let me just let me just loop this a little bit. Right? So the only real movement I had which was kind of complex there in that particular I went G minor 7 to the 13 flat 13 and then to the nine, essentially, which is a delayed, I was going to have a delayed resolution because I went up to the nine and then I can come down to my root. But here, and then here's my half step below, chord scale above, and then I could have resolved to my F minor seven. But besides that, Now the A flat, by the way, guys, is just a tritone sub for a D7 chord. So A minor seven, D7, G, C, right? I don't really know what it's what's in the real book. Um, oh, it does have the A flat. So yeah, I don't I don't really know how traditionally this song was written. If it was written with an A flat seven or if it was just a regular D7, because it's really just a tritone sub there. So you could go A minor seven, D7. G into the C, okay? Um, but again, for the most part, with this complicated section, I'm trying to do more of that stuff. Um, great question though, Dunya. Yeah, so the chord scale is gonna come from the scale that you're on, not the, not the next scale. Although, although in the new course is a great section on early resolutions, on early resolutions. So, Essentially, if you're leading into a chord, you can think about the new chord and play over that new chord in an early way because your ear is going to, it's essentially is going to lead us into that next chord. Does that make sense? So, so if I went... That's still the flat 13, though. That's in the scale. Let me, I'm trying to get a good example now. If I thought C my if I think C7 over the G minor 7, that's essentially will still work because my G minor 7 is going to lead into my C7. And then into the F minor 7. So essentially, that's a more advanced part of the bebop lesson. But yes, you can kind of like think about early approaches into the next chord. Um Yes, you always have to be looking ahead, always have to be searching like for the next chord tone that you're going to hit. Now, to practice your bebop, guys, just to kind of leave, with the, leave you with this final thought here, uh, I'll play a little bit more. Working out your bebop lines in, in, in the practice system that I've kind of explained to you and has I've been teaching today that kind of just came up in this, you know, the lesson and the, the education, no pressure, no time. You want to play your bebop lines if you're on bebop through slowly and just try to create them. So I might go like this. And I'm always trying to land on that new chord tone when the chord changes. There's two types of motion that you should always be thinking of, scalar motion or skips. Essentially all improvisation is, is a combination of steps and skips. Now skips usually aren't fourths, That'll be a more modern sound, but for again, for traditional improv, your thirds are essentially the skips. So you're either, you're either using um, steps, like whole steps or half steps, or you're using skips, which are about thirds, okay? So. A minor seven, A flat. I'm keeping track of the beats in my head. 
F minor, A, right? So if I go here, let me see again, if I get stuck for some reason, okay, let me see, one, two, and three, right? So I'm trying to work it out so that I hit my chord tones. I hit the F sharp now um, on the D7. One, two, and three, and four, and one. Here's my G minor. Two, and three, and now I gotta find a chord tone here, so I'm looking ahead. When I, again, when I get to about the end three or beat four, I gotta be like, okay, what chord am I gonna hit? One, uh, two, and three, and four. So here's my the seventh of my B flat minor seven. E flat seven, okay? Once you kind of have worked your, like worked this through, so you start to get the hang of it, then we put on the tempo really slowly with your bebop approaches. Okay, so I'm gonna put this down to 60. Here we go. Bebop approach to start off. Bebop approach to land on that C. Bebop approach. Bebop approach to N. Bebop approach, half step below. That's all scalar motion. Bebop approach there. A flat. Bebop approach. Bebop approach. Space because it's a two bar phrase. Here's Bebop approach to start my line. Bebop approach. Bebop approach. Scalar motion. Bebop approach. Right? So I'm utilizing my tools now. And as you could see, the majority of my bebop approaches started my line or ended my line. Now in the middle was either space or kind of scalar motion or skips. Right? That's like the general equation to playing improvisation, right? Now, if I go to speed this up a little bit, check it out. It's, it starts to really come together. I mean, even at that slow tempo, it doesn't sound bad at all. If I go to 100, I don't, this tempo, this tune's not usually played that fast, but here's 100. That was a delayed resolution. All right, bebop approach. Bebop approach. Motif. A motif is just a repeated idea, right? Re a repeated idea, excuse me. Some of the things I was adding in here as far as tools and, and, and sounds go where I was, I was kind of utilizing some flat nines over the dominant chords, some sharp nines. Um, and besides that, it was mostly just bebop approaches leading into chord tones. Again, your common bebop approaches, half step belows, chord scale above. Right, so I might go. But the problem here again, If I go up, I need to land on some sort of chord tone here, so I can't really go up, because if I go up my, a, my E flat major scale, I could do that little skip there, that sounds cool too. Right? So this is chord scale above, half step below to surround my root of my chord. 
I could use the same approach to my A minor seven. Right, or there's a new bebop, there's a bebop approach I really didn't use that much because it's more advanced. One and two and three, right? Anyway, a lot of information in this particular lesson, guys. Um, there was a lot of talking, I apologize, but I think a lot of it was super helpful. Um, yeah, so really think about your benchmarks, right? Your benchmarks in your improv. And again, foundation is everything. Foundation is everything. I know we all want to be able to do things quickly and have it sound like a pro, but the way to get there is to focus on your foundation because the more you do that, the better you're going to sound more quickly. Okay. Like I said, if you focus on miscellaneous sounds or spices or flavors, that's really all you're going to have. Like just small miscellaneous things with no meat and potatoes, right? You need some substance first before you start to flavor it with like lots of cool things, you know, reharms, more advanced bebop approaches like, right? Like this. Triplet feels, stuff like that. Ornamental things, right? All these like fancy, all this fancy stuff, it still stems from everything I'm teaching you here. So like it just doesn't make sense to pile the fancy stuff on first. Like get this stuff down and I guarantee you, you're going to be like 90% of the way there already. Okay, I promise you. The more you can start to focus on this, again, just these first three levels. Chord tones, scalar motion, and bebop approaches. Chord tones, scalar motion, bebop approaches. Landing on the chord tones as you move into your next harmony, really making sure you're landing on those chord tones. And then once you get this down, then you can start to throw some spices in. Like maybe you throw your, your blue scale in. Like even this. That's a complicated rhythm, right? One E and a two and three. That's a 16th note ornament I'm throwing in. So again, all these ornamental things are very advanced. Those are the things that make your sound, your improv sound just elevate the sound, right? Um, yeah, but you can start throwing the spices in later, okay? Hope that, hopefully that that helped, guys. Um, cool. Let's see. After feeling comfortable with the right-hand improv, how do you slowly introduce the left hand? Great, uh, great question, Ray. Yeah. The left hand... The whole thing about the left hand is that both hands need to be very comfortable on their own. Okay. Super isolated. And the best way I would, there's, I add, a, there's a lot of, uh, the improv course is great. I, I mean, it's actually really coming together. I was kind of hesitant about that because I was like, man, but there's different types of textures you can do with your left hand, left hand. The first one, um, Tom, I would think about is pads. So pads is a great left hand texture where you're not meaning you don't have to comp rhythmically. And there's three types of voicings that I commonly use in my left hand comping, um, which are in the course. Sh you ready? Shells, three note voicings, and full rootless voicings. Shells, three note voicings, and full rootless voicings. So you can try your pads with just shells. And pads, again, is just holding. So I'm just playing all half notes. So if I were to solo over this and practice with my right hand, I'd practice my pad first. So throw iReal Pro on if you want. I'm just going to practice my pad and shells. I have to do three notes for the minor seven flat five because you need that minor seven flat five. So I'm just doing my pads, shells. Now again, for the two fives, what I like to do is not replay. Uh, I like to just move the, the, the note. So over the A minor seven to the D seven, there's two different types of pads. You can do this and then replay the seventh. It sounds a little choppy to me. It sounds nice when you just kind of voice lead that one note that you need. So the seventh is moving down to the third of the D7. That's a whole nother thing you might not need to practice on its own, right? Just moving your two fives by voice leading without replaying the note that doesn't move, right? So for the G minor seven to the C7, I don't need to move this B flat, so I'm just gonna move that. Once your left hand has that down, 
the isolation is the name of the game. Always. Isolation is the name of the game. If you can get comfortable with something by itself, then you can add something else into the pot, right? So now that my left hand's comfortable, I'm going to solo my right hand over what it was just doing. I'm not going to change my left hand at all. <laughs> the next thing, this is just a great, the next thing to do, so a pad is a great texture, Tom, and then the next texture I would try start to work with is going to be call and response. And you can start to really systematically say, okay, I'm gonna play for two bars and then my left hand's gonna play for one bar and then switch off that way. Or you can say my right hand's gonna play for two bars, my left hand's gonna comp for two bars and switch off. Or just say anytime I leave space with my right hand, my left hand's gonna play and try to leave space at least every two bars. So that would go a little bit like this, right hand. it's funny as I was learning about left hand comping and teaching it in the course again a lot of what your left hand do left hand does in improvisation is one of three things it has a pad texture it has a response texture or it has some sort of just uh, rhythmic texture okay that happens underneath your right hand but not consistently like my left hand's not just randomly playing rhythms the entire time it's either doing one of those textures. It's not playing. It is playing a pad where it's just holding or it's, it's, it's playing in response to my right hand or it's playing some rhythmic texture kind of that fits. But for the most part, my right hand and my left hand aren't just kind of like randomly doing things together. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So let me see. It might sound like this. Right, so that last rhythm I played there kind of fit with my left, my right hand. Right, it was kind of like joined together. But for the most part, they're not randomly doing random things, okay? Hopefully that helps too. And again, the more you play with it, the more you learn about it, it just, it really fits. And for the most part, we think a lot of things are like way more complicated than they are. But really when you listen to things, um, a lot of it's happening a lot. It's just like, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of three things or like four things. It's just like a lot of simple things put together. That's really kind of what makes things sound good. Cool. I think my fingers is, is hurting a little bit from, <laughs> from playing. So I'm going to rest it now, guys. Um, cool. I'm, I'm glad Dunya. That's awesome. Alan. Yes. Um, great to hear guys. So again, the improv course, Cool. Yeah. So that was a great lesson. Um, I will put this, the replay on the, um, in the folder, excuse me, in the, uh, members area and work on all this stuff, work on your improv, you know, outline the chord tones, practice your chord skills, practice your bebop approaches, no matter where you're at. You know, if you want to try a little bit of everything, go for it. You know, I, I don't want to be the teacher that says, Oh, you can't move on until you get this master, right? That's not what the course is about really. And I changed my philosophy and a lot of things to give people more leeway about moving on. Like if you want to dabble in a lot of the other stuff to try and get that going, definitely go for it, you know, but just realize, I want you to realize that the more you can build up your foundation, the better you will be. But obviously there's a mental component, which I learned a lot in the accelerator program of burnout. Right. And I don't want you guys to have that. So if you need some sort of like, you know, if you need to go out for ice cream, cause you've been having no cheats for the whole week, go get some ice cream. Like, dabble in your bebop approaches, you know, have fun with your half whole scale, or your altered scale, which gives you some cool sounds, 
but then go back to being disciplined about your work. You know, sometimes we just need, we need that fun stuff. We need to go to an amusement park. We need to spend some money on a, a nice dinner out, right? We need that to like get some nice balance and like keep our motivation up. It's the same for this stuff, right? If you guys want to dabble in something else, go for it. Cool. All right, Alex, what's up for next week? Um, Alex, I believe comping and voicings are up for next week. So if you have interest in learning how to voice these like for solo piano, to comp solo piano for yourself, or if you want to comp with a vocalist or an instrumentalist, I'm going to be going over comping and voicings. And then I think the last class at the end of the month is going to be over reharms or like miscellaneous chord structures and movements to the tune, um, intros and outros too as well that I might use over this, or just miscellaneous things you might commonly hear played over this particular tune. A lot of times in jazz, like tunes lend themselves to like j just these miscellaneous things that are fun to teach and explain. Cool. All right, guys. Hopefully you guys had a great time. That was a lot of fun. And um, I'll see you next week. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to go to jazzpianoschool.com to check out all of our free, amazing education, all of the free podcast blogs. We do have a membership if you're looking to take a next step forward with us, get access to over a 1,000 different jazz piano videos, playbooks, mini courses, a main course curriculum, success path, and so much more. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at support at jazzpianoschool.com. I hope you have a wonderful day, and as always, happy practicing.